please. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called The Thing on the Purple Board. Me, I'm a roughneck. Well, I was a roughneck, I mean, 20 years ago, a little too old, too slow now. Besides, I got a dollar now, I don't have to be a roughneck, you see. Married, got a nice home. Had to meet my wife. Hey, Mike. Her name's Maxine, but she likes to be called Mike. Mike! Yeah, I guess she's busy out in the kitchen someplace. Besides, she doesn't hear very well. Shame, too, she's so pretty and everything. Well, you'll meet her. Sit down. I was saying I was a roughneck. Well, no, that doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. A roughneck is an oil field worker, specifically a guy in a drilling crew. Call them roughnecks like you call a section hand on the railroad a gandy dancer, a garage hand a grease monkey. Same time you work around a drilling crew for a while, you're going to be a roughneck in every sense of the word, boy. A derrick floor or a forble board is no place for a guy with a bow tie. Because you know, when you have to fool around with drilling holes that go farther down the ground than it is from the top of Pike's Peak down to sea level... Yeah, sure they do. By the time I was a roughneck, we'd got this one well down to 7,313 feet. That was a record. But last May, Pure Oil brought one in out in the Trona Valley in Wyoming at 14,309 feet. That, friend, is almost three miles. Quite a hole, that, huh? Sure, I don't think there's an oil man in the world that don't wonder one time or another what's down there besides rock and oil and gas. Oil that's made out of trees that died 20 million years ago. Oil that's made out of dinosaur bones. Oil that's maybe made out of the flesh and blood of men, maybe, that beat each other to death with a stone axe. Ate saber-toothed tiger for lunch. Hey, you get to wondering. You look at the cores that come up from way down there, and sometimes the little shells, trilobites mostly, that was alive when Manhattan Island, where New York is, was under half a mile ice. We found something once, me and Billy Grunwald, and something found us. I'll tell you about it. We were down to around 5,400 feet. We'd set casing. We began to get water, so we hadn't stopped drilling and cement off. Well, you see, when water begins to seep in the hole, you pull your drill pipe, then you let down a cementing shoe inside the casing, and you plug up the bottom of the hole, casing and all, with quick-hardening waterproof cement. Then when it's hard, you drill through the cement, go on down, and the cement outside the casing at the bottom keeps the water out. Well, we had the drill pipe all pulled and racked. The cement was setting, see? So we was shut down, waiting for it to harden. We'd been coring just before. Well, you see, a, a core drill is hollow, and as the bit digs down, it stuffs the drillings up inside it, so when you pull it out, you got a sample of the kind of stuff you're going through. And a geologist can tell a lot from that. So there's nobody around the rig except me that night. The rest of the crew's going into town. I was toasting some pork chops over the forge for myself, but I heard a car pulling up. Look out, it's Billy Grunewald, the geologist. Then I give him a hello. Hi, Billy, come and have a pork chop. Hi, Porky. Uh, where's everybody? They all went to town. I'm the whole crew. Yeah, I had three blowouts between here and Oxnard. Yeah, I wondered where you was. Ted said you'd be in here about three. Yeah, I would have been, except for my tough luck. <sighs> Oh, I'm dead. Yeah, hungry? Starved. Yeah, I got six, no, oh, seven pork chops. And bread. And some coffee, kind of. Swell. Hey, I got a bottle in the car. <laughs> if we going to have a banquet. Hey, where's that core? That's what I came up here to look at. Yeah, back there on the bench. Yeah. Look at it after supper. Hey. What? Didn't you say you were all alone here? Uh-huh. I thought I heard somebody talking. Yeah. I don't see anybody. Keep an eye on that pork chop. You won't have any supper. Yeah, I'm watching it. Yeah, let me put the coffee on. Like so. When did you finish cementing? This morning. Last tower only made about ten feet of hole, so Ted shut down before we get flooded out of house and home. Funny about that water. 
Mm, how? Oughtn't to be any at that level, according to my figuring. Well, there is. Is it salt? Sure, right out of the bottom of the ocean. Hmm, that's funny. Well, maybe I'll be able to tell something from the core. Yeah, I hope so. The last core I looked at, I'd have sworn we were getting into shale. Mm, ain't seen none yet, from the cuttings. That's funny. Here, your pork chop's done. Yeah, take some bread. Yeah, thanks. Oh, man. Good, huh? <laughs> yeah, put on another. I had two already before you come. Yeah, much obliged. Yeah, you know, you never can tell what's down there. You get it all mapped and plotted out, all the straighter. And all you know is what comes out of the hole. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go down there sometime if I was little enough. <laughs> never get you down a hole. Yeah, you'd fit. You're skinny. I'll stay up here and look at the cores, bud. Where is that one? Behind you. Over there. Hmm? Oh. Well, I'll have a look at it. Well, why don't you wait you finish your supper? I'm just going to look at it. Uh, put on another pork chop for me. Okay. Well, I wish I was screech out of the... What's the matter? Hey, wait a minute, Porky. Well, why do you... Listen. What's eating you? you? You know, I'd have sworn there's somebody up there in that portable board. Ah, you're crazy. There's nobody up there. Getting against those stands of drill pipes. Ah, they're just rack crooked. One of them slipped. Come on back and eat your pork chop. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. Only I... Ah, what you so jittery about, Billy? Come on, eat your sandwich. Here. Yeah, well, thanks, Porky. I don't know. I, I'm just naturally that way, I guess. I'm always scared of the dark. I'm scared. Doc, I, I, I hate to be a baby, but I can't help it. Scared of the dark? Honest? Stupid, ain't it? Oh, I don't know. Everybody's scared of something. Me? Spiders scare the tar out of me. Black widows. Oh. <laughs> I know how you feel, Billy. There another light over here? Yeah. yeah. Here. Ah. That's better. Hey, listen, uh, Porky. Go out to the car and look in the left-hand door pocket and bring back that bottle, will you? That's what I need. Okay, kid. Okay. So I picked up a flashlight. I turned around and went outside. I found the car. And I got the bottle. And the floor of the derrick was all lit up. And when I saw a beam of light suddenly flash up toward the foreboard board, <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> Billy Grunewald and his ideas... Sure, I looked up. There wasn't a darn thing up there, except the drill pipe racked against the fingerboard. Oh, this, uh, forble board. Well, you've seen oil derricks or pictures of them. You know that little platform that runs around the outside of the derrick about halfway up? Well, that's the forble board. Well, you see, drill pipe comes in lengths, and you handle them with several lengths screwed together so as to save time getting them in and out of the hole. Two lengths is a double, three is a thribble, four is a forble. When you pull a pipe, you heist it up inside the derrick of the traveling block, which moves up and down from the crown block at the top of the derrick. Then when a forble of pipe is pulled out, it's held in the rotary table. You break the joint with tongs, like a great big stilts and wrench, you see. Snub a cable that's fastened to the handle over the cat head on the draw works, and that breaks the joint. Then you hold the tongs on the pipe, give the rotary table a few turns to unscrew it. You heist away with the traveling block and swing it over against the fingerboard, lean it against the derrick. The guy up on the forble board takes off the traveling block. You do it all over again till you got all the pipe out, you see? Well, there wasn't anybody up on the forble board uh, except a screech owl, and it flew away. So Billy turned his light off, and I come on inside. And just as I come up the steps, he let out a yell. Yay! What's the matter? What's the matter, Billy? Hey, come here. Look here. Well, what's it? Look, Porky. My... Where did you find that? Now, listen, Porky, I give you my word. That was embedded in the core. Why, it couldn't be. I tell you, it was. Look where I dug it out. Hey, you know what? That rock there comes from a mile underground. And it's been a mile underground for a million years. And look at this. And I did look. And what he was holding was a gold ring... And it was all carved and filigreed, just like jewelry. 
And there wasn't any kidding about it. It was real. No, 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 wait a minute. Hang on, I ain't done. I poked at the Cora rock that looked like a uh, kind of petrified salami or something. And then it was my turn to pretty near jump out of my pants. Because right alongside the place where Billy dug out the ring, there was a mud-covered but very unmistakable finger. I picked it up, and it was cold, and it was heavy, and it was solid rock. At least it felt like solid rock. And I looked at Billy, and Billy looked at me. He started to rub the mud off this here stone finger. And as he rubbed it, it began to disappear. No, he could he could still feel it, he said, but when the mud was gone, neither one of us could see it. And he dropped it to the derrick floor. It went clunk, and we couldn't find it any place. So you know what we've done. When we took that bottle and we took and finished it, Billy and me, we finished it in one slug of piece and it was a full pint of bathtub gin. It tasted just like so much well water to me. And then we sat down on the derrick floor and we looked at each other. We didn't say a word. My eyes got heavier and heavier. The last thing I remember was I heard some kind of noise that seemed to be coming up from... Now, the forble board 80 feet above us. I shut my eyes a minute. I guess I went to sleep. And I had awful dreams. Black widow spiders crawling all over me with gold rings on their legs. Things I could hear but I couldn't see up on the forble board. Billy Grunewald climbing up the ladder outside the derrick in the moonlight. Faces looking at me, and I couldn't figure out who they were. Then I was waked up by a horrible scream. The crash alongside me that shook the whole derrick. I opened my eyes to see Billy Grunewald lying on the floor two feet away with a broken neck. With a broken neck... And his left hand, well, he put the gold ring on the little finger of his left hand, and the way his arms were spread out, his left little finger and the ring were gone. Well, friend, I got out of there. I run down to where Billy had left his car, and I got in. I stepped on the starter, and I couldn't get it to go, and then I remembered after I'm pretty near run down the battery that Billy had taken a key. I wasn't going up there and go through a dead man's clothes to get it. So I sat there in the car and shivered all by myself till daylight. And then Ted and the crew came. Afterwards, a state cop and everybody in the world was asking me questions. Did you and Billy have a fight, Porky? I told you we didn't, Ted. But you had been drinking. We only had that little pike, Ted. Well, what was he doing up on the formal board? Did you threaten him, and did he run up there to get away from Listen, you? Listen, cop, don't be a chump. Billy Grunewald and I were good friends. Then why'd you push him off the four board? I didn't, I tell you. I, I wasn't up there. Oh, what did he go up there for? I don't know. I was asleep. How do you know he was up there? I didn't say he was. You said so. Besides, how would he break his neck if he didn't fall from way up there? Well, look, officer. I think it was just another accident. I mean, we haven't got anything on Porky, and personally, I don't believe he did it. Well, so. it's mighty mysterious. Uh, so it is. But we got work to do. Now, how about it? That cement's hard down there. I want to start drilling again, and I'm short-handed. Will you let Porky stay here till I run in my pipe again? And, well, then you can take him and ask him questions till you're blue in the face. Well, all right. Okay. Let's get rolling. You got steam up, Happy? I'm all set. All right. Porky, you go from the formal board. What? Not me, Ted. Oh, don't be such a boob. There's nobody up there to shove you overboard. Well, you can put a safety line around you if you want to. And besides, you're getting paid to do what you're told. I've lost too much time already. Come on, boy. Oh, 
So, okay, I go up on the Forbo board. And you can bet I took a good gander around before I did anything else. Now I couldn't see a thing. So I signaled to the driller to let down the traveling block, and he did. Came sailing down from up above. I was just reaching for it to pick up the first four below drill pipe. Gave a big jerk, and the cable broke. It dropped and nearly pulled me off the four below. And it landed right on top of Ted. And if you have any idea what a guy looks like after two tons of metal land on him from 80 feet up, yeah, you keep your ideas to yourself. was enough. Two accidents in a row. The whole crew quit. They, they wasn't going to wait for a third. And it was Ted's money that was paying off. There wasn't any more. And as far as I know, the abandoned Derek is still there. And that was 20 years ago. Oh, I forgot to tell you something. That traveling block was right in front of my face when it broke loose. It was hanging by steel cable, three-quarter inch steel cable. And I saw that cable break right before my eyes. It looked just like a piece of string when you snap it between your fingers. I could almost see the fingers. And you know what? There was something up there on the forbal board with me. And so a couple of days later I came back. I, I don't know if there's anything in the world as desolate as dismal... As dead-looking as an abandoned oil well rig. There it stands like a skeleton off on a deserted side road in the bare yellow hills surrounding it, and it's the deadest thing you ever saw. I sat in my car for a long time looking at it. Everything was just the way we'd left it. I, I looked in at the floor. The smashed traveling block was there alongside the rotary table. There was a little mutter of steam from the boiler. That was all. Then I heard a tinkle of something as it hit the ground alongside me. I looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight. But at my feet was the gold ring that Billy Grunewald and I had found in the core of rock that came from a mile underground and from a million years ago in time. And I heard a little sound. The sound of a kid crying. And there wasn't any kid up there. And I heard it again and it came from above my head and and I, and I took out my revolver. I loaded it carefully. I started up the ladder to the forbal board. Well, there wasn't anything up there, nothing I could see. But there was a voice crying. The voice of a little kid. And then there was a movement behind the rack of drill pipes, and I saw the pipe move, and I yelled, Come out of there, whoever you are! Come out, or I'll start shooting! And the stand of pipes shivered, and I thought... What can it be that can handle that heavy pipe like... like Jack Straws? And then there was a crash. The whole stand of pipe fell over and I just got out of the way in time. And I was alone on the forbal board with the thing. But I couldn't see it. I felt the platform tremble under my feet again as something moved toward me. I fired two or three shots. And nothing happened. I started backwards. I knew it was following me because I could hear it meowing like a cat. My feet tripped over something. I saw it was a big can of red lead that somebody had left up there. Without thinking, I picked it up and I threw it at the sound and it splashed. And there it was. And I wish I... I wish... The face of a little girl, frightened, crying with hunger and terror. Hands like a human being and a finger missing from the left hand. And a body. I'll not tell you about that. I told you how I'm scared of spiders. But I knew where it came from. It had come from the bowels of the earth, come riding up on the drill pipe as we yanked it out of the well. Come to an alien world and was lost. It stood there dripping with red paint, blood red from head to foot like some horrible dream. And it put its hand on my arm. Its hand was stone, living. 
moving stone. Ah! And it looked into my eyes and mewed like a lost kitten. Twenty years ago, I discovered many things about it, what it used for food, that it was deaf, that it was invisible and couldn't see people when it was invisible, that if you sprayed it with mud or paint or grease paint, makeup, then it could see people. And believe me, I didn't want to see its body. I can see that in my nightmares. But its face, I can't help wanting to see that pathetic little girl face. I'm afraid maybe I've fallen. Ah, But it's very beautiful. And when it's well made up, it's... But making it up, rubbing grease paint on a stone face that looks at you and smiles and it makes sounds like a lost kitten yet. I can disguise the body in long dresses. She can't hear very well. And when she's hungry, I have to stay out of her way. I found out what she likes to eat, remember? No, no, sit still. Sit still, do. Sit still or I'll have to shoot you. I want you to meet my wife. Or rather, my wife wants to meet you. Mike. Mike. There she is. Come on in, dear. The title of tonight's Quiet Please story is The Thing on the Furble Board. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper and featured Ernest Chappell. And Dan Sutter played Billy Grunewald. Pat O'Malley was Ted. And Cecil Roy was also a member of the cast. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Sound? Sound by our good friend Albert April. Now, for the word about next week, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Well, I'm reasonably sure that all the characters in tonight's stories were completely fictional. At least I, for one, hope so. Next week, the story is called Presto Changeo, I'm sure. And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Listen to them. Yes, they they still laugh and dance and, and play the night away, but... Oh, I, I shouldn't have drunk so much wine. I must hurry now to the villa where, where she's waiting, yes. Waiting for him, for her Fortunato. Oh, you, you at last. Oh, oh, you're like a beautiful painting, soft. Soft in candlelight. But your lips, they are cold. And your face, what has happened to your face? And your eyes, your white staring eyes, and the lie that grows in them. No, no, you. You don't wait for me, you. You wait for him! Yes, uh, I should have known, uh, but I did not want to know. Uh, I could not believe that you would fall for that, for that too pretty face, for that pretty voice, those, those pretty things set in so pretty a way. Oh, but now I, now I know you. You wait, while I'm, I'm wait, 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 wait for your Fortunato. <laughs> you know, know you. 
You couldn't know, no. You you only feel, yes. And and while there is fear, there's life, huh? Just a little life, but it burns. It burns like a candle. The little wind of fear blows softly, and, and it whispers he will not come. And then the candle flame flickers and almost goes out. But then, then a soft wind of hope whispers he will come. He will and the little flame struggles up with light. Yes, but... But he will not come. He... He will not come! Ever! Hmm? Have I seen him? Have I seen your lover, Fortunato? Oh, of course I've seen him in the street, and I... I knew it was he because I heard the jingle of the little bells on his cap, and... And I knew him despite his jester's costume, and... And beneath the mask, I, I could read his foolish, pretty smile. And I, and I took him and, and went down to the dark passageways under my house on a hill. And, and he followed me laughing and, and excited at what I promised at the end. <laughs> <laughs> there, I said, there you shall taste my greatest treasure, my, my finest wine. A cask of ancient Amontillado. <laughs> then I then I took him by the hand and I and I pulled him toward the solid rock behind the shadows where I had prepared an opening yes uh, an opening to fit the form of your Fortunato I, I put down the candle and I said now now you shall taste the Amontillado and then he turned and and I was upon him as he turned and I I shoved him and and he he fell forward into the opening that was waiting for him, and, and then I, I slammed the stone into place. Soon as he was done, and when I flung away the trowel, and I, and I cried out to him, Hear me, Fortunato. But he could not answer me now, for in his mouth there was stone. And in his heart there was ice. And I heard him shriek and... And faintly... The sound of his pounding hands. And faintly... Faintly the little bells on his cap. Jingling. 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 Then... Then there was nothing. And I left the place... Where Fortunato is waiting. Yes, he waits. And you wait. And you shall wait. Wait forever. I have condemned you and I... I've counted my words as they slowly killed you. As I looked into your eyes and watched the little flame slowly die. <laughs> now go down to him. Sit with him. Play for him, sing for him, and cry to him, whisper to him, and listen. Listen, and perhaps, perhaps you'll hear him breathe, and, and perhaps you'll hear a soft tingling, tingling, tingling of his cap. Yes, the tingling, tingling. Tinkling of the bells. And so, dead among the living, may you wait for your Fortunato as he waits for you. And me, I'm condemned too, condemned forever by my own love.